Hello, this is Disha Bakchi for The Print, and we're back with Lieutenant General H.S. Panag to discuss his column from this week, Stop Obsessing Over Leading from the Front. It Doesn't Justify Sacrifice of Army Officers. Welcome back, General. Thank you for being here. Disha, always a pleasure to discuss my column with you. So this week, we discussed the Army's approach of leading from the front. So firstly, could you explain to our viewers what is this approach and why do you believe it's become a reckless trait where the fundamental tactics are being disregarded within the Army? See, uh, leading from the front is a military virtue, a military trait, a leadership trait that decides the fate of battles. Imagine a situation that enemy fire has pinned down attacking troops. Casualties are taking place. The methodical approach is not working. Mission is at stake. And the, the fear, uh, which, is, which is always there in such situations, is omnipresent. And uh, the, it's only the leader who gets up, says, follow me, and leads the attack, carries the day. So this is a time-proven um, time proven um, a sort of military leadership uh, uh, trait. You can also call it, a, call it a principle. And all armies endeavor to, you know, imbibe this, uh, uh, this trait in their young officers and young soldiers who are the mainstay of combat. Now, at the very onset of the article, I mentioned that leading from the front is not a brash, ad adrenaline, fueled, impulsive action, but it also must adhere to tactical norms. It is not a foolhardy action. It must adhere to tactical norms so that all necessary precautions are taken, yet the leader is leading from, from the front and inspiring his troops. That is, since the risk is high, casualties of leadership is high, it is always reserved for most critical, um, uh, critical um, uh, missions, and it should not be practiced, uh, practiced as, a, as a norm. In fact, Indian Army takes great pride um, that is leadership, uh, officer leadership leads from the front. Our uh, ratios of uh, officers to soldiers killed in battle for 1965 was 1 is to 18. For uh, 1971, it was 1 is to 20. And for the Kargil War, it was 1 is to 17, which is relatively very high because the authorization of officers in the army uh, Armies all over the world is generally one is to 35 to 40. One officer for 35 to 40 uh, soldiers. So the disturbing questions which you have highlighted that have been also raised is that uh, uh, there are very high casualties uh, of, uh, of leadership. That has it become an obsessive trait with the officers that they must lead in front and they are violating the norms. And... Uh, or is it that uh, the junior leadership uh, is not uh, being uh, has not been empowered adequately because it's a, it's a layered leadership below the officers there are JCO or platoon commanders there are NCO section commanders as to why are they not leading from the front these are disturbing questions now to specifically answer as to why does this why does this uh, why does this um, uh, this thing take place one is uh, that uh, it's a it at times in it's the ethos of of an uh, of an army where they say leaders must lead from the front. So it's it's uh, it's almost it almost becomes a sort of a um, psychological compulsion that the officer has to lead. Uh, it's a it's a kind of a uh, ethos uh, and all encompassing all encompassing feeling. The second is that. Every mission, every action is taken as 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 a sort of as an end in itself. That uh, there is no relativity given to the importance uh, to the to the to the various uh, uh, you know uh, various actions. Like for example, in an insurgency, uh, 
insurgency in jammu and kashmir has been going on for nearly you know 35 33 35 years from uh, 89 um, um, onwards it's 34 years and uh, uh, and today it is at a very low ebb there are sporadic terrorist actions in fact terrorists are not proactive so now to treat every action every encounter as a be all and end all and uh, you know in the hurry to get the terrorists disregard tactics disregard uh, the the precautions that we all are supposed to take and suffer casualties is is is, is the reason why this is why this is why this is happening and uh, i have given two examples there uh, of uh, one is of of lord cardigan no here was a case of uh, uh, obsession with obsession with the uh, with the with, with the principle of uh, of leading from the leading from the front and also disregarding your command responsibility the so lord cardigan at balkalawa that is the famous charge of the light brigade he received the orders through the adc of J- lord regnal lord regnal was his superior that you have to go and capture the guns the guns to be captured were actually on on to on on a hill feature to the south uh, uh, to the south and uh, whereas nolan once he reached uh, lord cardigan he misinterpreted the orders instead of pointing out the guns to the south of, on the south hills that is the causeway heights they were known as causeway heights he pointed the guns at the end of the valley no so it was the kind of a Poldron, the causeway heights on the south were held by the uh, Russians. The northern heights were also held by the Russians. And at the end of the valley, about a mile long valley, there were the guns. So instead of pointing to the causeway heights to the south, uh, he pointed to uh, the uh, the uh, guns at the uh, in the end of end of the valley. Now, uh, Lord Cardigan's command responsibility should have been that this is. Uh, probably a wrong order and it is the suicidal uh, kind of a charge and he must uh, uh, sort of check back with the superior and then proceed you know um, and if at all at any stage you felt that a disaster is taking place he could, could have called off the charge but what he did he was uh, obsessively possessed with leading from the front he put himself at the head of the charge so there were 700 men that took take part not 600 as it often understood 700 men and they were in three lines and he was five horse lengths ahead that's about 35 to 40 feet and for the mile of the charge first they began to trot canter then gallop he was right in front he didn't even look back because he felt it's an insult to look back and he was the first man to enter the russian guns but he had attacked the wrong guns and the ch- entire light brigade was decimated this is one example i give the second example i give is that in jammu and kashmir in the insurgency environment uh, there is a repetitive pattern the terrorists are few they are not proactive they in- trigger a small incident and the army sort of focuses on that on that incident the terrorists also plant information at times through their sources who are through their uh, sympathizers who are the sources of the army and the police that there are terrorists in so and so area and they then move in that is and that area is difficult forested and the troops are lured into an ambush the normal procedure the fundamentals are that you never move without security you carry out reconnaissance you always assume that information given by civilians is is a trap is a lure then after you have carried out the tactical movement you establish cordons there's a outer cordon there's a inner cordon and then methodically you approach the place where the terrorists are now what is happening is that the officers are in a tearing rush and of course they lead from the front but they disregard all these fundamentals and walk into the trap and as a result the casualties are heavy in the kokarnag 
um, um, operation, which we discussed about you know three four months back in the month of September, uh, there were three officers killed, one commanding officer, one company commander, one police officer, and only one soldier killed, and only two terrorists killed. Then in the recent operation that took place last month in in Rajouri, again there were two officers, two more soldiers were killed, and only two terrorists were killed. So this high ratio of officer casualties, you know, being equivalent to the number of terrorists killed, is it 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 it, it shows that we have we have we are disregarding fundamentals. and we have also become obsessive with this particular with this particular um you know noble ideal which is reserved for very critical situations uh of course i mentioned earlier that uh, it, it's the non empowerment of jco that nco leadership which is also the cause of this so you highlight some important uh significant uh, issues firstly the high cost the high ratio between soldiers killed and terrorists killed but you also talk about the disempowerment of jcos and ncos and question why they aren't leading from the front in the within the army so what do you think is causing this see sections are commanded by havaldars ncos that is an nco and platoons are commanded by jcos in our rashtriya rifle battalion as well as in our infantry battalions and uh, at times young officers are also given the charge of commanding commanding a platoon uh, in a battalion there are only uh, 21 officers authorized but there are over 60 jcos authorized and there are over 150 ncos authorized so we have a layered structure for close combat that is sections platoons which Three platoons constitute a, a, a company. So logically, they are the mainstay. And like officers, if the leadership ethos of the Indian Army is that we of we must lead from the front, then so must the Havildars and so must the Jaisios lead from the front. So either the officers do not have that much of faith in the subordinates that they want to lead themselves. or as i mentioned they are in a tearing 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 hurry or the jcos and the ncos are not adequately empowered i have given an example how in the second world war the indian army fought in vast theaters north africa burma right up to malaya you name the place where indian army did not fight and we had only 11 officers per 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 battalion and now we have 21 double the number of officers that means we have put more officers that means relying less upon jso than ncos in second world war the company second in command was a subedar at times he commanded the company so this is 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 a is a kind of a cultural weakness uh, as well as a a training weakness in the sense that jsos and ncos are not empowered uh, are institutionalized training for them that is our ncso the ncso academies firstly we don't have dedicated academies we run courses for them you know kind of capsules uh, at the training establishments then the vacancies are only 25% that means only 25% jso and ncso's get a chance to do institutionalized training to command effectively command platoons and sections and their training is supposed to be within the unit within the unit the training is handicapped due to um various commitments of in operation areas in peace time there are so many commitments and then infrastructure so it it is just it is very difficult to carry out proper training so consequently there is a gap in the empowerment of the jcos uh, jcos and uh, uh, jcos and uh, ncos the german army uh, you know uh, the allies used to wonder and even after the war the second world war there was uh, various studies carried out why did not the german army lose its cohesion uh, it began the war with one officer per 30 soldiers it ended the war with one officer per 300 soldiers and as i said the last battles was in the sewers of uh, of of berlin so why how did they retain their cohesion 
their main strength was their NCO core. Even during the war, they did not allow any NCO to become either a section commander or a platoon commander unless he had spent six months in the, in the NCO's academy. And they had adequate number of them. And they also had a system of direct intake of high caliber, uh, caliber material who joined directly as section commanders and uh, as platoon commanders. So this was the mainstay of the, of, of the army. So whereas we have, as I told you, our institutionalized training is suffering from lack of capacity and the battalion training due to lack of, due to commitments is not, um, not is, is inadequate. So we are not making full use of our JCOs and and NCOs. And a um, very interesting example I have given of, of all the armies I've given of Israel. And uh, now uh, the, the most interesting example is that the IDF, their standing army is just about 1,70,000. And out of these only 30% are regulars. And 70% are conscripts who come in for two years, two and a half years service, men and women. And uh, they have reserves, uh, you know, like they have mobilized 300,000 reserves for the, for, the, for the Gaza war. Now, um, till there have been reports published in the Israeli newspapers, in the Jerusalem Times, and uh, it is updated as of yesterday. Uh, 445, uh, 445 Israeli soldier, officers and soldiers have died since the 7th up to 14th of uh, uh, 7th of October up to 14th of December. And uh, out of these, 116 have died once the ground offensive began. That is towards end of November, you know, around about 27th, uh, 28th of November. Now, almost 300 were killed on 7th October itself in the initial action of the Hamas and then in the counter action that was taken to, to evict Hamas and, uh, you know, from, from, uh, from the area where they had entered. Uh, so, uh, now the point is, the point here is that 112 officers have died. 112 officers, including the colonels, lieutenant colonels, majors, captains, and a large number of captains, uh, very few second lieutenants. Uh, the ratio of officer to soldier casualties is one is to four. Why? One is to four. Whereas we, as the Indian Army takes pride, and I mean, we, we said uh, ratio in Kargil was one is to 17. Here it was one is to four. Because here is the mass, the officers were leading a mass of poorly trained and poorly motivated conscripts. And the mission was critical. Mission was very critical. So that is the reason why it happened. If you do not empower your JCOs and NCOs, there'll be, it's almost a compulsion. There is no choice for the officers but to lead from the front. And consequently, the leadership casualties will be high. Right. So how do you think we can strike a balance between following this ideal, as you mentioned, of leading from the front, but also maintaining the fundamental tactics that are so important in ensuring this high ratio is avoided and this high cost of losing so uh, high ranking officers is avoided? You see, firstly, it's an ideal that all armies must possess. Because at the critical time, it is this ideal that pays dividends. You know, once earlier I had written an article long back, I had given the example of Raja Post. Uh, Raja Post was a critical post in 1965 war, yeah, you know, at a height of about 8,000 feet. And uh, normally we attack at night to avoid aimed fire. And the battalion, second Sikh was the battalion, it got stalled just below the crest. That means it was getting daylight, either the attack had to be abandoned or it had to be now pressed on. It was now or never. And uh, the casualties were taking place. Um, the enemy fire had pinned down everybody. The entire unit was stalled. There was Colonel N.N. Khanna. He 
uh, he stood up on a rock and he had a jersey. He was instructor from the High Altitude Warfare School of white and uh, you know green jersey. He waved it and moved his hand like this and told the soldiers, follow me. Uh, so the few men next to him got up. Then others, then others, then finally 300, you know, small teams, uh, rather the 300 total soldiers in a number of small teams of sections and platoons, they all started moving forward and the objective was captured. Colonel Khanna died in the operation. He was later wounded. But here is a classic example. Mission was very critical because this had to establish the Uri Punch link. And uh, attack, earlier two attacks had failed on, 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 on the post. So it was a critical mission. And here was the officer uh, who you know, galvanized his unit. But at the same time, he was not foolhardy. He had taken tactical precautions, but it's just that in the subsequent operation, he got he got hit. So it's a virtue that must be uh, must be imbibed. It must be sustained, and all leadership must possess it. But not only officers; it also must be possessed by JCOs and NCOs. It must be cultivated in them also. They must be adequately adequately empowered. So normally, when you carry out any uh, operation, any mission, you execute. There's a methodical approach. It's laid down. It's time proven since centuries. So it is that you have a firm base, you take all precautions, you have a fire base, and you advance towards the objective with fire and movement, taking all precautions. Right? So it is only when this method is failing, this method has failed, and the mission is critical, and the mission is critical, that leading from the front must uh, must be exercised by the by the by the leader, mm -hmm. but if the mission is not critical, then he must exercise his discretion. There's no point being a Lord Cardigan. Every time, every time, this uh, repeatedly, so it will only lead to more and more more casualties. Follow the methodical approach. Empower your junior leadership, and use this noble ideal only for critical missions. And right. It should not become a kind of, it, the worst thing that can happen is that if it becomes a compulsion, because your junior leadership is not empowered, as it has happened in the case of Israel, which I exam gave an example, one is to four casualties. So it's an ideal which I would like every leader to have, officers, JCOs, as well as, as, well as NCOs, but exercise with this kind of tempering, which I have mentioned. Thank you, General, for your insights. I think you brought up some very interesting points, firstly, talking about the leading from the front approach, but also looking at how this approach can be used without disregarding the fundamental tactics and most importantly, the need to empower the JCOs and NCOs within the army to follow this approach and avoid the high cost. Uh, so thank you so much. And for viewers interested in reading the full article by General Panag, the link to it will be in the description below. Thank you and we will see you next week.